Hi, I'm Robert Estrin here at livingpianos.com. Today is the start of a new series, a weekly series of questions and answers. Those of you who've been reading my newsletter probably know that I answer your emails. Well, I decided why not do it on video and make it enjoyable for everyone. Today we have three questions. The first is from Kevin. Kevin asks, I live in the mountains of Big Bear Lake, California, where the humidity is often in single digit to no more than 20 or 30 percent. What are the risks of keeping a piano in this type of climate? Do you have any suggestions to keep the potential damage caused by the climate to a minimum? Well, this is a good question. Well, actually 20 to 30 percent isn't so bad. The ideal is going to be in the high 40 percent. And yes, you're right to be concerned about excessive dryness. Wood joints can dry out, soundboards can crack. There's a whole host of issues. Ideally, you get a humidifier for the room. Problem solved. Well, if that's not practical for one reason or another, there are other alternatives. You may have heard of the damp chaser system. That's with two P's, damp chaser. They provide technology that sits under the piano it has a humidistat, so whenever the humidity gets to a certain level, it will add humidity to your soundboard. There's also heating rods, so if the humidity is too high for people living at the beach or in Florida, the heating rods will engage to keep the soundboard from getting too much humidity. So that's what I'd recommend. Try to do something with the room first. If you can't, get a damp chaser system. Also, keep the piano closed whenever possible. Windows closed uh, if you have excessive dryness or humidity. If you can keep the windows closed and keep the room conditioned, that's the ideal answer for you, Kevin. Thanks for the good question. I'm sure a lot of people probably will benefit from that. The next question is from Dana. Dana asks, I'm wondering if you've ever done a video on performance practice of J.S. Bach ornaments. I know the specific ornaments like mordant and trill, etc., but was wondering if you've weighed in on where and when to use them. My understanding is performers could add ornaments like spice whenever they wished. It's considered a type of improvisation in a sense. Please advise if you've made a video or have a link to someone else that has covered this online. Well, Dana, you're absolutely right. Baroque music was really very close in some ways to jazz. Of course, in jazz is a lead sheet and the performers improvise their entire part. Well, did you know that back in the Baroque era, Telemann, Vivaldi, and others wrote trio sonatas where they had figured bass, not unlike a modern lead sheet. The figured bass were not notes on the staff, but only the chord symbols. And the keyboard player, yes, would realize a part improvising the music. More than that, the ornamentation. And what is ornamentation? It's making little fancy embellishments. Now, the composers typically write these little squiggly lines that indicate trills, mordens, turns, and other things. And there are books, volumes of books written, what these little markings mean. And you know what? Over different decades, there are different performance practices that people accept as what was gospel back in the day in the 16 or 1700s. The fact is, we can't really know what people did back then. It was too long ago. So there are accepted practices that you probably want to stay within only because if you vary too much, people will notice it sounds rather odd. However, if you could make a convincing case, I think ornamentation, even in places where they're not indicated, can really heighten a performance. For example, the wonderful pianist Jeffrey Beagle has some Bach recordings where he plays the French suites, for example, that all have repeated sections, and he does them two different ways. So every single time the sections repeat, he does embellishments that are different on the repeat. And that's a wonderful idea, isn't it? Because if you're hearing the same section twice, why not play it a little differently? Certainly any skilled jazz musician would do that. So I would say, ultimately, use your judgment. Make something that's musical and interesting. Try not to distract, however, from the score, because if you do too much, you can lose the essence of the music itself and the majesty of the Bach or the Telemann, that, what the music they actually wrote. But certainly, creative license is, is inspiration in the right hands. We have one last question, this one from Bruce. Now, this is a pretty complicated question. I'm gonna do my best to answer this for you, Bruce. Bruce asks, 
Here is a question about huge bass from a 158 Souter. Why and how can a super large high tension bass produce a better bass than many nine foot? It has more clarity and more vibrations and it is not duplex per Ulrich Souter. One theory is that the low end has so much power that you bring into the tone short vibrations from the very heavy wires despite being padded. What I found was an interesting tonal quality not found on my Mason and Hamlin upright. As you stated before, sometimes the piano gets better as it gets older. I also recall your love of the grand. The pianos worked very well for our small and very hardworking chamber music group. Best regards, Bruce. All right, well you bring up several issues here. Now the Souter, why does the Souter have such a spectacular bass compared to other pianos you've played? There are a lot of possibilities. Now I don't know the exact answer to your piano, but I can tell you some likely contributions to that. First of all, if a piano has an excellent scale design, I've heard some phenomenal bass out of really small pianos. In fact, my very first new piano that I ever bought was a 1981 Baldwin Model M, and that bass was really amazing for a five foot two inch piano. Some scale designs just have better bass than others for the same size piano. I've played some nine foot pianos that have disappointing bass. Now there are many things, you're right, the scale tension, the thickness of the wire, but more than that, the soundboard, how it tapers on the edges, where the bridges are placed on the soundboard, there's so many factors that can enter into it. Let's not dismiss the possibility of the voicing of the piano, how hard the hammers are. Yes, when you play a piano over time, it can actually improve in sound. Is this because the ages of the wood or is it the hardness of the hammers? Well, the answer is yes, it's a lot of factors. And in the hands of a great technician, they can work and actually improve the piano over time. As for a Mason and Hamlin upright compared to some grands, well, you know, Mason and Hamlin uprights, I played some that are absolutely spectacular instruments in, in regards to sound. Can they compare in tonal quality to some grands? Absolutely. In fact, the soundboard area and string length of some uprights, like a full-size Mason and Hamlin, can rival or even exceed many baby grands. And the scale design of those instruments are unparalleled. So you might get a better bass and overall tone out of a Mason and Hamlin upright than many baby grands, certainly, and even some grand pianos. Of course, in a room, it's a challenge to place an upright because the sound goes out the back, yet the back of the piano is not so pretty to look at. So typically it's up against a wall and the sound gets soaked up into the wall instead of a grand piano where it projects into the room. So a lot of it depends upon the acoustics of the room and the physical space that you're working with. These have been great questions. I encourage all of you to ask more questions. I will personally answer as many of them as I can. Thanks for joining me, Robert Estrin, here at livingpianos.com. Until next time, see you then.